Welcome everybody. I'm Daniel for it is late May 2023 and I'm here in La Subia in Spain and I am glad to welcome you to this gathering and teaching and guided ritual learning time on being with culture and the ancestors and how to do that in a resourced way. I like to open with a prayer so I'm going to do that and then after that, I'll uh, share for a few and then invite the other three wonderful co-leads and co-presenters to each share for a few. And at that point, we'll head into a bit of guided uh, ritual practice, and then we'll open it up for some questions. And I imagine 90 minutes will pass kind of quickly in that way. But I would just invite you to gift yourself with the time to be as present as you can be. Sure, we're here to learn, but we're also here to listen directly to the ancestors and the larger uh, group wisdom and powers that support us. So let's hold it in that way. Good. So join me, if you would, uh, with setting a little intent with the prayer. Mm. Give acknowledgement to the holy mystery that is within and around me and all beings. I give acknowledgement to my own ancestors and to the ancestors here of this land in La Suvia, Granada, Andalusia, and Sur de España. I give acknowledgement to the ancestors and the supportive powers of those present and those listening and after, and of those co-weaving the vessel tonight. May our time be rooted in love and humility and kindness, and may something good for the people and something nourishing and beneficial come through. And may our offering tonight be in solidarity with all those who are hustling and loving and moving with an open heart and making great effort for a more kind and just world. May there be great success in those efforts. Thanks, Shane. So again, welcome. Uh, let me speak as a moderator host for just a moment and then as a presenter, and then we'll flow from there. So I'm Daniel Four with Ancestral Medicine, and briefly, we do a lot of teaching on ancestral reconnection, earth reconnection, cultural change, ritual arts, things like that. And uh, this offering today is especially congruent with the upcoming Ancestral Lineage Healing online course with the in-person Ancestral Lineage Healing intensives in Germany and France that are open that I'll be guiding with supporters and with the Ancestral Healing Practitioner training. So if those offerings or anything else we're up to, including working directly with Practitioner of Ancestral Healing, if that has energy for you, there's a lot of opportunities to connect over at the website where those things happen. Also, each of our presenters have their own practice, their own offerings in the world. We'll put that in the chat while you're here. It's part of the information we share, so feel great about connecting with them. They're doing great things. Okay. We're each going to speak for five, seven minutes about a few key things that have to do with the intersection of trying to be a responsible adult and participate in cultural well-being and to do that in a way that's spirited, ancestrally connected and whatnot. So for one, I'm down lineage personally from early German and English settler colonialist in North America. So I grew up as a white dude in the suburbs of Ohio in the US. I live now in Spain, but that's a recent move. And Within that, I didn't have any context for any, really anything. I wasn't equipped. I wasn't given a framework for how to relate with the spirits for the rest of life. And I certainly wasn't encouraged to recognize the genocidal badness that is the foundation of the creation of the United States as a political thing. So it's been a journey. I'm 45, a family and a life, and it's, it's an ongoing journey to decolonize or uproot or recognize the conditioning that's landed in my life. I want to say two things about what I've noticed about that, specifically 
around the specialization of helping people engage in ritual work around ancestral healing over the last 20 years and running that process in my own life. And, and one of the two is the, uh, the a thing that keeps me motivated and excited, genuinely, teaching what in a lot of ways is the same stuff year after year, is the way that I see reconnection with the ancestors on a lineage-based level, work with lineage ancestors as an antidote and an interruption to a conditioning that's extremely individualistic that a lot of people receive. And maybe you didn't get that to the same degree that I got it. But as like a PhD educated American white dude, I have been conditioned to see myself as a kind of pillar of individuality. And it's, it's a harmful kind of conditioning. And it's isolating. And it's contrary to the kind of cultural change we need. And what I have found in my own life and in supporting others is that seeing ourselves as part of lineage and part of the larger earth lineage, and so uh, breaking down this human, other than human binary that separates us from the rest of life, even though we're not separate, like getting at that is really helpful because we st can start to understand ourselves as a spiritual being that's not just isolated in the sense that the question isn't, oh, what's my destiny personally? What am I supposed to be doing personally? The question is a little bit of like, what are the unpaid debts and what are the intergenerational blessings that I'm down lineage from? How does my life find meaning in relationships with others? How can I be a participant in change? And, and in like bringing goodness and love to the world. If we approach cultural healing work or cultural change work or work for social justice or work for systemic change, which is critically needed. So like just engaging in it is way better than not. But if we approach that from a view that is unconsciously recreating individualism, we're gonna to tend to be less effective we're going to tend to burn out more quickly, and which might feel righteous in the moment. But if you're really passionate for like four or five years, and then you're toast, and then you become very conservative or something after, that's less awesome than having a long-term sustainable trajectory where you are networked into all these other beings and being true to your own way of participating in change. And so there's a... Um, a way that work with the spirits, with the land, the earth, the ancestors, um, interrupts and softens the tendency to see ourselves as isolated individuals. And that's really, really important if we're going to stay well over the long term. There's a lot of ways to become less than well, right? And the other principle to be succinct about all this is that of uh, participation and the importance of becoming more, not less entangled in the world. And to become entangled with our local eco ecosystem, to become um, like, let me say it. Um, uh, if we want to have a sense of belonging, we need to be invested and to actually bond and to have the vulnerability of forming attachments and to bonding with the land, the ancestors, other humans, and to, um, to show up for our relationships and to get involved and get all entangled in a messy way. Because if we're not messy with life in that way, we have no leverage. There's not real solidarity. So solidarity comes from getting messy and getting involved, and get, and that can look a thousand different ways. It doesn't have to necessarily look like outward activism per se. And thanks for everyone called to do it in that way. That's super important. But the entanglement and the sense of uh, uh, really just being um, interdependent with others, work with the ancestors, gets at that softens our sense of identity to be part of a lineage, part of a group, and to know that what we're obligated and drawn to engage with is intergenerational, it's cultural, it's land work, etc. So I think that's most of what I want to say 
from my side is that um, I see folks of lots of different backgrounds have their sense of individuality and isolation that they didn't even know they were carrying softened from coming back into relationship with the ancestors. And from that softening, their participation is more nourishing and joyful and ultimately more effective and work for cultural change. So with that, let me welcome the first of our other guests, uh, Irku, uh, Irka Mateo uh, Akutu, and I'll um, invite her to share from the heart however she wishes. Thanks so much, everybody. I have forgotten that. <laughs> Hi, home, Daniel. Thank you, Daniel. Um, as I can know, Dairi Le Irka Mateo, the Trajava Taino Inaru Akutu Maria Cuspego. Thank you, all of you, for being here today. My name is Irka Mateo, and I am an elder and grandmother from Hiskeja, which is the Dominican Republic today. I want to acknowledge the, this land, uh, Los Angeles, that is the land of the Tonga people, and I want to thank them for accepting me here and uh, being their guest today. I will continue with um, an opening prayer. Gawaralu da ebiyono a antira kuya a toho urukuda ni ikiwa ibeketi hai wa anikino kaye no kenari kai omabu simiku au. Iti atosa abaru to matosa le, isi hiaiki jaha o kaidan muka ama, anuka ho oma anshihi amuliha kena atuno. I'm calling my ancestors and your ancestors to bring light to this gathering, to fill up our hearts, our tongues, and our heart with sweetness so that everything that is said here today will be taken with love, compassion, and respect. I come from um, the Dominican Republic, which is a Kiskeja in our land. We are Tainos, and uh, we come from uh, the Arawak people from the Amazon. We were also um, the first people who, who have discovered Christopher Colombo lost at the sea. And um, they came to our island and created the first, um, the first cities. And uh, this was the center of the colonization to Central uh, Mexico, Central America, and South America. Since very early, um, they, they considered our, ourselves extinct because they er erased it, us in the census. In like in 1565, they were just saying that we were just 200 people. And uh, this also was, was one of the, of, of the uh, excuses that uh, they had to start the slave trade from Africa. After um, this was um, this was acknowledged, then um, our brothers and sisters from Africa started to arrive to Piscaya, uh, to the Dominican Republic, and there they started populating um, the Abia Jala, which is the name that we have for America, the, the land of the people. So this, um, they thinking about our erasure continued for many centuries, and um, and even in the 20th century, some um, the academia was not recognizing us, and until everything started to change in the 80s, and we started this movement uh, from from the myth of extinction 
to reclaiming our survival. And today, 40 years later, we are having the people be identified as, uh, as, in, as Taino people, as uh, Afro-Indigenous people. So what, what we have done, what we have done to, to uh, work in these wounds of culture and, and keeping, uh, keeping joyful and, um, and, and with, it, with a, a zest of, for life and for, and for enjoying our, our life here on earth in, in, in this time line that we will have here. Um, so I'm going to talk here about something that is uh, monumental because we are reconstructing a nation. And, um, and the way that we have done it is um, first off um, by, by studying, studying and knowing and researching who we were before. Uh, who, the, the who were the ancestors who lived here before the colonization? What, were, what was their culture, right? So we did that by studying and in all the chronicles of, um, of the conquistadors and also by field research. We went to all these remote places, to all these, um, the countryside, so that we can have the knowledge from the elders, because this culture, as it was not extinct, it continued to pass, be, be passed down uh, generation to generation to today. And we have even rituals that we will never thought that were there to, to our main ancestor, Jukahu, for example. So this, no, doing this work of knowing who we are, where we come from, um, it is something that gives us this sense of, um, of, 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 of love, of, um, of it, it brings sacredness and, and it brings the seriousness that this, that this type of work needs at the same time that we feel so relieved and so joyful because we are doing it. After that, we started implementing all the things that we were learning. So we started creating ceremonies, we started to create art, we, uh, we started to create prayers. So we started this, uh, this reconstruction project that has been uh, going along, right? And by creating community, we were feeling less alone, that less alone. We, we see that we have people around us who, who, are, who are thinking about the same things, who are wanting to reconnect with these ancestors so that we can feel whole and we can honor them because they were, just a second, they were, they were, they were considered extinct. So they were, they were forgotten. And we, for us, it was so important to bring, to, to tell them we are here, we haven't forgotten you. We are here and we are going to do the best we can, you know, to have you in our hearts and then just to project this in, in our island so that people know who we are and that we are still here and that we are recovering our culture. After we have been practicing all this and bringing all these things to life, all the things that also the elders were doing and they were teaching us, then we created these communities and the healing began. Then we started doing also ceremonies and, and talking and healing circles where people could be vulnerable, where people could um, express themselves and know that they were in a safe container. Community, creating community is the most important thing for, for staying um, with, the, with, with, with purpose and with joy in your heart because you know that you are doing something that is impacting people and that, and that it will be having the ripples and at the same time, as I said before, we are honoring our ancestors. And, and another thing that we do is like, a, we just don't get together in community for the, for the ceremonies or the healing, or the healings, right? The talking and healing cir in a circles or the healing sessions. We also gather outside of, uh, of these sacred moments. We do virtual, virtual encounters every month where people come and to share what gives them joy. And it has been beautiful 
because um, everybody, you know, Joe is contagious. So this work is very hard and we need to, to nourish our heart with the joy. Then also we have been um, gathering, I, I live here in LA, in Los Angeles, right? And then we, the people here, we get together outside and we go to concerts and we see, go to see indigenous um, powwows and uh, or concerts or just go for, for a coffee. So community for me is the base of, uh, of staying healthy. It's, is working with the ancestors with love, with compassion, with respect. Because for us, the veil between the living and the dead is very, very thin. And people has a very familiar um, relationship with the ancestors. If you had, if you have your grandmother, your grandfather who passed, and you you had you knew them and you had this relationship, after they pass, you continue having this this familiar relationship with them. And not only that, you are also allowed to be mad at them. You know, so it is this this is a this is a relationship that is that flows flows very 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 softly with the respect. That, that we always keep with, with our ancestors. There is another point that um, our ancestral ancestors, um, they, they were very funny, they were very tricksy. And in, in some ceremonies, you, when, when these ancestors are there, the, the representation, you can see how they love to play with people. So this is a trait that we have also inherited and that we, in, that we have in, incorporated in ourselves and then and we practice too. So after we do the sacred work, the work, what we do, we be silly, we celebrate. And, uh, and what we are celebrating, we are celebrating that we are doing the work of, of honoring our ancestors who were there for, for given for 500 years. We are honoring them and, and we are following their, their ones. There was one cacique Kayakoa who said at the end of everything, women, you need to mix with, with the conquistadors. You need to, to mix with our brothers and sisters from Africa. This is the only way that we were going to survive. And we did it and we are here. Then they, the, um, the ancestors going to the trickster. So you can, you can see when they come, they are, they are um, very funny. And we do that after we uh, finish the sacred work, then we go and we eat and we dance and we play instruments and we sing and we tell a lot of jokes and we say, and, and, um, and also we tease each other. So this is the way that uh, our ceremonies, all our sacred um, spaces end, is with, with, this, it is with this joy also that we have been working. So, you know, some, some people, if they think uh, that, that this is naive, it's such an such a important and sacred work that we are doing, no, no, it's not. It, this, is, this is the way that, that we, that, that we, acknowledge that we are doing an important work for our ancestors and for ourselves and then we being like this being joyful we create community out of the sacred then then the community is even even it has more cohesion it's more cohesive right and we can feel that every time you know the community gets uh, with more strength and more strength so this is um, what I had for you today um, that you can apply also if you are not doing this kind of, of work of reconstructing, you know, people. Um, but it can be also done with uh, our, our ancestors who are in proximity to, it's like making your family, your community. And, uh, and going deep too, so that everybody can can join in doing this ancestral work 
and um, and having every day a more joyful and more healthy um, connection with with your present family, which can can become your community in your ancestor or with your with your friends, you create another bubble of uh, of ancestral work, but community and uh, and doing sacred work and doing and and celebrating will keep you together and with a lot of hope and faith in your heart. Thank you, Haham, for listening to my story. Thank you so much, Akutu. Hello, everyone. I'm Chiang Kim, and I am, just, it's wonderful to be here with all of you. And just as a way of introducing myself, um, I'd like to share that my ancestors are from Korea, and I'd like to offer a brief prayer in Korean. So if you would, please, please join me in whatever way feels good to you. Sarangwa Chiegwa. Harabanim Chosangim. Harmanim Kamsamida. Each Haria Suriwa Hamke. And we offer gratitude to the loving and wise grandmothers and grandfathers, the bright benevolent ancestors. And we thank you for all the ways you help us to remember that we have a place here, that we are beloved, and that our lives are precious. And we thank you for being here with us. And please help to create a, just a really sweet and kind connected vessel and for those who are wanting to find their way into connection with you, please open that path with ease and in delightful and unexpected ways. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Kutu, so much. It was really beautiful to hear your connection with your people and enjoy that's coming through. When I first started connecting with my own ancestors, um, I had assumed that they were going to be all like formal and very serious and kind of stern. And it was really wonderful to, to know that they were also quite playful, that there was different personalities, that it wasn't all about these like very stern, strict ancestors. Um, and they also had this kind of this playfulness about them. And they often lovingly tease me when um, I get too serious about stuff and too serious about life. So there's a way that they also draw that out in me, that playful um, aspect. And so it's been this interesting exploration for me of this dance of formality and play, tradition and innovation and improvising and connecting in with my ancestors in a way that is um, also respectful you know, and, and connective and heartfelt. In Korean tradition, um, we have ancestor honoring rituals where we prepare all of this traditional food and we offer incense and rice wine. And um, it's beautiful and also quite elaborate, you know, and it takes a lot of time to prepare the foods. And um, I also, I live in a small town in North Carolina where I don't have access to a lot of the ingredients, you know? So it's, I've learned to improvise over the years. And in improvising, I've discovered offerings that aren't traditional, but my ancestors really love, for example, honey or chocolate. And I offer this with the intention of just a reminder of sweetness of life and the sweetness of our connection. Or there's a kind of um, traditional fruits that we offer and they're arranged in a, a specific way. And sometimes I'll do it that way. And other times I will um, 
just arrange them in a way that I feel is really, that's beautiful as a way of offering beauty to my ancestors, you know, and just to draw that out more into life. So it's been really helpful to just play and experiment in, in these different ways. Um, also in just prostrating to the ancestors, you know, um, and sometimes I'll do that, especially with certain holidays or certain dates that are significant in Korean tradition, um, or when I'm with my family tending my father's grave. But often it's just a simple bow in and just offering a simple glass of water and some of my tea in a way of just like, let's be together. And um, thank you for my life and please help me with this also you know with these things that are going on in my my life and it just feels less formal and more intimate um and in working with um people who are new to ancestral connections there's often this um, sense of nervousness or this fear of not um not doing it right or feeling like they're gonna offend the ancestors in some way, or this real grief, right, of not knowing the traditions and the rights, you know, of ancestors. And many of us don't have access to these things. So I think we actually do need to improvise and to bring a sense of playfulness in that as well. And what I find is that when we come with respect, when we come with humility, when we come with vulnerability, it's, it's often well received, you know, it's received in a good way. And so just the permission that it's okay to be messy, it's okay to be vulnerable. There are so many times, and um, I appreciated Kutu sharing this, where I've shown up to my ancestors just really irritated about something that's happening in my life, or just really angry. And they tend to be, resp to be responsive when I'm being authentic. Right. So not showing up in some like perceived way of, you know, that it's got to look a certain way. And what's important is to show up for the connection, to invite your people into your life, to be vulnerable, to ask for help, to make the time to actually listen or sense however it is that they are communicating with you and to take necessary steps or to take the actions that they are, that they're suggesting, you know, if that's feeling aligned for you. And this helps to build trust and this helps to um, show that you're also listening and that you're connecting in in this way. You know? To say thank you and to offer gratitude for your life, you know, and for this connection. Um, And I want to speak to the importance of actually being, bringing your ancestors into, converse, into the conversation. So being in a direct conscious connection with them, which is different from just speaking about the ancestors. You know? um, and it can be a stretch for a lot of people. It can bring up all sorts of things for many different reasons. You know. Um, the cultural messaging that we don't do that, that we don't speak to our people, you know, and I actually grew up with this message, um, even though I've tended ancestral altars with my family, you know, we'll prostrate and make offerings, but then we just kind of turn away and we're in silence. And it's also a way of respecting them to say, here, please enjoy like this, like this thing that we prepared for you. You know, um, but I was never encouraged to speak to my ancestors directly. And it was actually a revelation for me when I realized that I can do that. You know? And, um, you know, I've had clients share with me, particularly clients of um, Asian, East Asian ancestry, who grew up with this messaging that was a bit fear-based, you know, from their parents of like, oh no, like we don't do that. Only certain kinds of people do that. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's a very different thing when we actually invite them in into our lives, you know, on a regular basis. And some other messages might be this belief that we don't have well ancestors and that they can support us. Mm -hmm. um, and particularly if you've come from like uh, families where there's been harm and 
it's interesting as I find that the ancestors can also provide so much of that like reparenting or that healing that um, many people didn't get growing up. You know, or the belief that, um, you know, their fear is like, we're not supposed to do this. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not safe to do this, to connect. You know, it's not safe to trust and not, not trusting that we can actually connect. I've heard many clients um, say I'm not intuitive, you know, that they come in and they're like, I can't do this. There's no way I'm not intuitive. And I just want to say that we are all intuitive. We have this capacity. And for many people, it's been, it's underdeveloped, you know, because of the just cultural messaging that says the mind and the rational is more important. And so I think we lose touch with something that's so important, that's just intrinsic to being human. And um, it's something that can be developed. It's absolutely something that can be, that can be developed. So just an invitation to just gently notice any stories or beliefs that you may be carrying about why it is that um, you can't connect or the fears around connecting. And I find that the ancestors are, are just so available for connection and, and supporting who we came here to be and what we came here to do. They're really invested in that. You know, and for me personally, it helps me to have the courage to keep sharing, to keep sharing my voice, to keep sharing my gifts. And I, I live in the U.S. and especially in this um, sort of dominant culture that says only certain voices matter, you know, and it's still important to speak up and still important to, to share. And just the tenacity to keep showing up and knowing that they have me, that they're holding me you know, and providing this larger perspective of sharing, sharing my gifts and my life in service to life, you know, that helps me to just keep showing up. Um, and we all have access to these connections, we truly do. So I'll pause here and I, I'm excited to hear what Luis has to offer now. Yeah. Thank you, Chiyong Kim. So beautiful. Mm. I'm taking a look at the gallery view and anyone's welcome to join me because part of what I'm bringing here, what I'm adding to this altar that we're creating is uh, sensation. What does it feel like when we talk about our ancestors? And I look across this virtual sea of faces, I just see seeds that have been blown from all over the earth. You know how profound that is? And so I'm looking at each face and like my body has a story not even my mind, but it knows that face, it knows that land somehow. There's this connection that's so beyond what my mind knows. And that's my prayer for all of us to, to check out if you want to, to look at these faces and see what happens in your body. What parts constrict, what parts unfold, what parts weep, what parts get giddy. What parts see something or someone familiar? Hmm. You know, for me, my body is, is the altar. Like I can make a lot of beautiful altars and I can worship a lot of beautiful places. My body is the altar that I carry. And it's like in my mind, visually, each of my ancestors have built this altar that is me now. And it's not poetry, it sounds poetic, but it's it's biology. It's like the fabric of my body. You know, I can see my grandfather, mi abuelo's nose, it's like as if he just pasted it right there. <laughs> and I can see their hair and 
their ears and arms and legs and eyes. I see all these different people in my family and old photos of people I haven't even met that make up my body and my face. That's how intimate the ancestors are. They, they are the body. They aren't just this idea that we're connecting to in the mind. Like they're right here. And I've had the, the honor of working with Akutu and she has helped me connect to my Taino lineage so beautifully. And I'll, I'll never forget one of the most powerful experiences where I went uh, to Puerto Rico and um, I thought I was going to have this huge sensational experience. And I've gone there a bunch of times, but I thought I was going to have this especially sensational experience. And it was lovely. It was really beautiful. And, and then I got home and I think I had like a bar of salt, uh, a soap bar made from salt from a, a little town in Puerto Rico. And I just looked at it. I just looked at it. And I was in my bathroom in upstate New York in Woodstock. I looked at this bar of soap and it's like fingers, thousands of fingers ran across my body. <laughs> and it was this really uh, powerful like talk about the trickster, talk about the play. Like I thought I had to spend a lot of money and a lot of time and get on a plane and go into the mountains and be still. And like, that's when I was going to hear the ancestors. And I heard, I felt them even more clearly in my bathroom looking at a bar of soap. <laughs> and so it's this, for me, it's like, how funny, how amazing, you know, what a trick. And it, 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 it just brings me back to the feeling in my body how they move through me, how they feel through me, and that the accessibility, which is why I love somatic work, all you need is a body. You know, it's excellent if you can go to those ancestral lands. It has been life-changing for me. It's excellent if you can learn your languages. Excellent if you can eat the foods and the herbs and just uh, the prayers and the clothing styles, like all these things that invoke the memory that was forgotten. My friend Asha Frost calls it re-indigenizing. You know, invoking those bloodline traditions so your body can remember what maybe was taken from it or it had lost. That's all so beautiful, right? And then there's this direct accessibility as you sit here and breathe right now. That your breath is touching your ancestors right now. You need not go anywhere or do anything, but just feel how your breath enters your body. And you're communing. And I was so moved when Cheong Kim said, I, uh, I wrote down, you know, the intimacy. It's one thing to talk about the ancestors. It's another thing to be in, to talk to them, to connect directly, to be intimate. I don't know a greater intimacy than the felt sense of the body. You know, it's so powerful. So one thing I wanted us to consider as you're sitting here, even just the talk, just the word ancestor, just that word, what your body does with it. Just notice for a moment, what does it do? Not the story, not the even the images, which are beautiful, but the body. How do you breathe when you think the word ancestors? What do your shoulders do? What does your belly do? Does any movement emerge? What happens in your body just at the idea of them? Whether you know them or not. It's like, in my mind, I can get to know them better. And in my body, they're already here. Like, I can feel them without even knowing where I'm from. That's pretty powerful. Hmm. Yeah, I think the, the piece that I want to land on for now is one of my favorite ways, what Akutu was saying about this work can be really heavy, really intense, really deep. Depending on your lineages, it can bring up guilt or fear or shame or tragedy. And so many things can emerge. And the play, the movement, the dance, the humility, the joy. One of my favorite ways to honor my ancestors is to rest. I love laying my body down and knowing I'm also laying their bodies down. And my ancestors really laid their bodies down so I could be here. They did not have it easy. And I get emotional, you know, when I say that because of the gratitude. I don't get as emotional because I feel bad for them. That has happened. I'm at this place now, just the gratitude. 
Um, I'm an herbalist and I love to watch how plants, you know, expel their seed into the wind and the plant dies and the seeds they implant somewhere. Sometimes 20 years later, sometimes 120 years later, they grow depending on the soil, right? That's what our ancestors did for us. We're all here because they survived something just long enough to pass the seed on so we could inherit it. When I rest, I honor them. When I experience joy, I honor them. When I experience pleasure, I honor them. So it's one of my favorite ways of honoring them just to indulge in the gooeyness of my survival, my life, my agency that they didn't have that I have even as I want to affect change in this lifetime, still just to ground into, oh my goodness, how much I have because they laid their bones down to make mine. I, I don't know a greater love. And so um, I'm going to close with that for now. And thank you all so much. Thank you, Luis. And... Um... I wonder if you would feel good about um, starting to transition us into a guided practice. We'll take 10, maybe 15 for that. And each of the four of us will weave a portion of the practice. And the intent is for you to have a space to commune as clearly as you can with your ancestors or as um, open, like in an open-ended way. This might be a new kind of thing for you. It might be very familiar for you, but in a fresh way to notice what the collective wisdom and love of your people have for you right now. So that's the intent, basically, to make space for them and not only speak about them. And I love it, Luis, if you would um, weave us in to begin. Absolutely. So let's think of... Um... Think of how Daniel just said that right now. I just want us to hear that again before I, I go into this. Right now. So let's start just by feeling right now where we are. Feeling where we are. What does the room smell like? What's the temperature on your skin? What are you sitting or standing or lying on? Think of honoring those ancestors through your rest. Can you feel, can you, does your body open to the support it's sitting on and experiencing? Let's take a few seconds to breathe into that and feel that. And just see how the body responds to that. And then allow your eyes to connect you to where you are. It'd be great if you could look out of a window. If you can't, that's okay. But if you can see the land where you are or feel it under the floorboards, if you're inside somewhere and you can't see outside, how does your body relate to that land? Really notice how you feel that in your body. I'm seeing the wind just blow these tiny flowers from a tree all across the lawn. Like, what does that move in me? What part of me reflects that back in my own cells? Just like Daniel was saying, the animism of our relatives, not just the human ones. Look at these plant, animal, insect relatives around you. How does your body respond? Letting ourselves get present for that will beautifully, beautifully allow you to feel the ritual that's about to unfold. So I call us in through our bodies and allow each of you Allow yourselves to see what body parts allow themselves to be here. What feels good, what feels stable, what feels open to receiving. And if there's any issue feeling the body or any overwhelm, hold a pillow like you're hugging it and feel the support of the pillow. And I will leave it now to Daniel. From that place of being rooted in your body, notice your connection to the sacred in this moment, however that is for you, your guides, your connection to God, to the earth, to love and kindness. You notice how it is right now. Take a moment and resource in that.
And hold intent that your personal space be clear from any negativity, interference, anything that doesn't need to be around your space right now. And hold intent that there be a gentle layer of protection or containment around your space so that only what is rooted in love and wisdom and welcome is uh, allowed to be near you. From that place of being rooted in your body, connected, clear, and protected, notice outside your circle of containment that you're connected to a lot of different people in spirit, a lot of different ancestors, just of blood, not to mention all the other ones. Take a minute and just notice a little bit from all those different connections without a need to do anything about it. And notice that some might still be kind of troubled or in their process. Some might be turned away. Some might have all kinds of things going on. And some of them are undoubtedly, whether you know their names or their stories, deeply, deeply rooted in a sense of wisdom and kindness and love and a big awakening spirit, turning toward life and toward connection. And without needing to know their names or to make a story about it, in this moment, hold intent that those ones draw a bit closer. And those who are still in need, just for now, take one step back from your personal space. So you're inviting your connection with the the mighty dead, the wise and kind ones among your people to draw close to your space in a way that feels all right to you. And one thing we do when we invite the ancestors to draw close is we don't rush to do a thing. We just rest in presence with them. That's the invitation in this moment is to just share in presence with those who are safe and loving and benevolent among your connections to the greater and to the collective wisdom of our species here. And in resting in that, I'm going to invite Akutu to bring drumming and song and voice. And the intent is just to be in presence with your people in a way that's rooted in your body and not needing to make anything happen. And eventually after that, a different thing will happen. But for now, just be with them also in this group field that we have here.
Noticing your connection with your people now, however it is that you sense them in this moment. And it's okay if it doesn't feel super clear, but just stay with it.
And just noticing what messages do your people have for you? Especially in this time of just great change. Is there a message they have for you? And allow yourself to just sense into that response. And perhaps noticing what it feels like in your body to be a bit closer with your people. And just notice if you can drop into that support and that care so much more. And just taking another minute or so in that direct connection. As you're with this connection, just knowing how you feel it. Like Jiyoung Kim said, like, how do you, the closeness, how do you feel the closeness? What part of your body feels that closeness? It's really noticing that. As we're orienting in the next two minutes to transition back into a space of witnessing, sharing, asking, weaving, maybe place a hand over this part of your body that feels the connection right now. Going back to what I said, touching the ancestors that are speaking through you via sensation and see how that feels. See how that part of the body responds to your touch. You're the one touching, but who's responding? Just pause and notice that. And whatever place you're touching into, whatever response you're getting, see if there's any movement or stretching or sounds that want to emerge from there or not. Each body will be different. See what it's like to let that live through you, let them live through you, move through you, express through you, through movement. And as you're doing that, gently bringing your eyes in while the movement continues or the stillness, whatever your body wants to do with this, and letting your eyes show your body where you are, like bringing you back to the room you're in and feeling the room, looking around at the room. You know, smelling it again, 
noticing the temperature. Whatever you found in that short journey, bringing it into the room with you through your body right now. Okay, take your time with that. Staying with that connection as we open it up for the option to folks for folks to share or ask a question to all or any of us. Um, I would just bring us back for a moment to the intent of the gathering that we're intending to say a thing about how we participate in uh, work for cultural well-being in a way that's sustainable. And we've been talking a bit about the ancestors and a bit about relationship and levity and community and, so, and, and about caring well and being attuned to the body. And it, for me, it's just, it feels important to underscore that how we approach our participation in the larger times that we're in will inform if we're able to keep at it year after year. Is it spirit guided? Are we moving in relationship with the bigger forces? So that's the invitation is to let your longing for an even more kind and just world to follow from relationship and to stay rooted in relationship. Let's open it up a little in the time we have. I wanted to invite some shares. If you, if you would, if you have a thing from the heart to share, I would invite you in light of it being a larger group to, uh, you know, to go to the heart of the thing and to, um, yeah, let it be more either a question or perhaps a, a heart level share and less uh, um, an additional teaching per se. Uh, so yeah, I see uh, Nikita and if you're able to be on video, it's great and it's okay if not as well. And I might respond to things that have come through the chat a little. And if you want a certain person to respond, feel free to specify. Yeah. Um, hello. Mm -hmm. Hi, we can hear you, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so I had a question. Like, I have time and I'm just It's a little difficult to hear you. I wonder if uh, we could try without video to see if the connection quality improves. Uh, sorry to take you off video, but give it a try again to see if it comes through well. Just give Uh, maybe try one more time. I'm not hearing you well. Yeah, sorry. The connection might not be so. No. I can hear your voice. Give it one more try if you would. Yeah. Hello. Can you hear me now? I can. It's much better. Go for it. Okay. I switched to my phone actually. Um, yeah, so I have tried the ancestors uh, thing before and just like we were speaking about the grandmothers and grandfathers and if we can relate to them or if we know them and, and if we have spent time with them. So I had this question because uh, I don't have a very good relationship with my grandmother. Like uh, she was very abusive to my dad and to my mom. So... I don't have a very good relationship. I cannot say relationship, but uh, her image in my mind. So when I get to this point of uh, sharing gratitude, till that point I can go. But then after that, uh, you know, taking in that, it feels a little difficult for me. It feels like uh, I am taking in, uh, I don't know, it just doesn't feel right. So any, yep. you know, guidance. Yeah, um, sure. 
I, I'm I'm happy to give a go with that question. Then at the other three, if you want to add something, it's welcome. But feel well positioned to say a thing about that. Um, for one, when when I say when we say the ancestors, uh, the recent or remembered dead, the ones who you know something about, are they're like the part of the ocean that you can see from the beach. It's real, but it's not the whole picture. It's not the whole thing. The, our connection with our ancestors is our connection to the larger wisdom of humanity, of the collective wisdom of the species. Our blood lineage ancestors are one access point. It's not the only one, but it's one that's available to everybody. And if there are folks who have lived and died and who are not at peace, which is very common, it's possible to deliberately and safely call in ancestral support to repair those ruptures or breaks in the lineage. That's what exactly what we do in the ancestral lineage healing course. That's what the practitioners do. The, I'm certain that Akutu has her own ritual tech for that and Luis. So there are many ways to get at that. But at no point as someone who specializes in work with the ancestors, would I ever suggest that someone should directly connect with the troubled dead? It's possible to do it, but it's not needed to do it directly in order to bring them the assistance they need. And so you can, um, in a practical way, can your connection with the elder grandmothers on this lineage doesn't have to come through your grandmother who during life maybe didn't show up in the best way. It's important to allow for the possibility that she can change and that she can grow and that she could find peace in spirit. But I don't assume that that's automatically happened. It's possible that there's ritual and prayer and tending that might be needed for that to be the case. But the dead are a complicated hot mess. Sometimes they're really hazardous and we need to have a boundary with them. And sometimes they're fantastic and they run the whole spectrum. So engaging with the ancestors calls for uh, discernment, for sure. Yeah. Uh, and, and so that's why I say in the practice, connect only with what is decisively loving and wise and kind. And the rest, well, that's a project. That's a different undertaking. And you can do that safely and carefully over time. Yeah. But thank, thank you. you. Very, it's a thank common so and important question. Yeah. Um, I'll pause for a moment, and then if there's if none of the other three jump in, I'll I'll go to the other uh, some others who are speaking up. Yeah, um, uh, Kanye Nala, and I, I won't necessarily go in a linear sequence here. So. Hi, can you hear me? I can. <laughs> Okay, hello everyone. Um, thank you for this opportunity. Um, I have a question, but also it, it may um, come across as a reflection of what I'm going through and maybe to receive some insights or clarity because I'm at a moment in my life where my path is taking um, an a brought a, a turn, um, a very instant turn. Um, but I, I come from South Africa and I've lately been feeling the call to go um, and look up um, where my ancestors come from. So I grew up in KZN, which is a place where I interacted with um, people that weren't native to my mom or my father's side. And now I've been feeling this need to go in search of my ancestors just for a deeper connection and for a sense of understanding because my mom was someone who really blocked the tradition side because of the trauma that she um, sort of received because her father used to harm, which now is my grandfather and ancestor. Also same from my father's side, um, her mother used to harm. So there is this one ancestor that I do feel a very strong connection daily, 
but because it's it's something that just happens spontaneously i cannot really put it into words or something like that but after i felt for some time to go back in search of my ancestors i kind of felt that i was maybe holding on by the search of wanting to go and look for them or find the sense of understanding of who they are where they come from now i just feel like because there's so many of my ancestors that harmed why don't i just leave everything behind and reconstruct my own traditions or walk away um yeah, yeah. i think i, I think I a question in it uh, i mean yeah thanks uh i i couldn't speak but i want to pause to see if any of the other presenters are feeling really moved to jump in if not i will yeah um i think it's important my instinct in listening to you specifically is that it's important to not allow what has been harmful in the recent generations to fully define your ancestors and to define your connection in in that specific way to uh, humanity through your people reclaiming our connection with ancestors of blood, even though there's been a lot of harm, is worth getting messy with because it's a way of saying this specific body is holy. Like Luisa's uh, affirmation that like this body is the expression of, it's the face, the extension of our people in this form. And it's important to like the ones who are healed, my sense in what you're describing is a common kind of thing that is that they're reaching towards you. And they're saying like, hey, don't let the pain and the disconnection define you and us. We're not only that. Yes to all that, but not only that. There's also beauty here. There's also goodness. And also, on a global level, we're in a deep mess right now. And one thing, one way that shows up with the spirits is they're leaning in. And they're like, hey, like, let's lower the bar. Anyone even modestly willing to listen, like, can you hear the alarm going off? yeah like come on come on now so there's like not that we have to live in fear or like freak out as an energy but there's a sense of like uh, a, a lot of folks are being called and it's tricky because people are like i got a calling i got no framework i'm like yeah totally you and 75 million other people and like so we're um you know improvising the framework but respond as Ji Young was saying, respond anyways to the calling. It doesn't have to look traditional. It doesn't have to make sense. You don't have to have the next breadcrumb. But you move toward it. And Akuta's work of like dedicated decade after decade cultural recovery and finding the joy in that and the surprises of being met and nurtured along the way. Yeah. So that's a little bit of what I'm, and don't feel like you need to undertake the yes alone. You can call in support. So, you know, you might do this trip, you might do this ancestral recovery work, and you can connect with them right now, both. Could I add to that? Yeah. I just, very brief. I loved when you said respond anyways. I just wanted us to hear like anyways in any way, like respond anyway, any way you can is a response. And I love what I'm hearing from all of us is relationship is what sustains this process. And like you were saying, Daniel, is what keeps us from burning out and getting injured in our own bodies as we do this. So any capacity, any improvisational intuitive way your body wants to respond 
that's a way an ancestor is probably moving through you that you could never even know. So there's a humility in that just natural responding without the thinking of how or why or can I. And I just really appreciated that. Yeah, thanks. Um, Brandon? Yes, hi. Can you hear me? Yep. Can okay. You. Um, my question is not, sorry, I'm not sharing my experience. I have a question from the previous shares. Um, when people are saying that their ancestors communicate with them, I'm really curious how that looks. Um, I mean, I did the the course with you guys that started in February and it was amazing. And I had some interesting things like some animals appeared at one point and I had a dream. I found an object out and about. Um, and for me, those felt like answers. And during the meditations, I always felt like I wasn't hearing anything. And I kind of thought that was a problem until I started to see some synchronicities in the world. So I wanted to ask, you know, other people, you know, especially your presenters, uh, the first two women, they, I was like, what do you mean your ancestors are funny? Like, what are you, how do you know? How are they talking to you? So thank you. That's my question. Yeah, I can jump in here. Thank you, Brandon. It's really common what you're bringing. And it's connected to what I was sharing earlier about um, reclaiming intuition. It's something that is just really underdeveloped for a lot of people. And to be gentle with yourself on that, yeah? Because I think that's also cultural recovery work, you know, to just um, move in the world, not just in this like mental sort of way, but like opening up the to the, the different kinds of sensing. And often people are new to this work. There's this sense that it's going to be the visual. You know, there's this sense that like, we're going to see the grandmothers in front of us, or we're going to get this like downloaded, very clear, like a movie message. And it's often not like that for a lot of people. You know, there's so many different ways of perceiving, you know, yes, visual, but also somatic and sensing through the body. I mean, that's one of the strongest sensations for me. And that's often how I get messages is um, my emotional body as well as sensations through my body. And then it's also important to take a moment to sort of interpret that. Like, what does that mean for me? Because we all have symbolic language that's very unique to us. And um, so letting go of this feeling of the sense of like they're going to be right here and it's going to be visual or you know they're just going to download all, all these stories or messages to you yeah um and there's a way that you can also ask okay i'm receiving this sort of image perhaps you know or a memory of some sort and if i were to interpret that in a visual way what would that be so there's a way that you can get all your different senses online but it takes some practice but lean into what's there already and see what's there. And what you just shared, I find that ancestors are super into just sharing through dreams and synchronicities and waking life. I feel like they're constantly trying to get our attention, but we're just going about our day. So not to dismiss when you are having a sense of something, spend some time and be curious about that. You know, um, Another thing that I wanna offer is that sometimes it's a kind of like hot, hot, hotter, hotter, colder kind of thing, you can ask them some questions and, you know, this is what I'm sensing here. Am I on the right track? And just notice your body sens sensations and notice what you're receiving there. So that's what I have to offer, yeah. Uh, thank you to you. <clears throat> um, we, we also feel in our ancestors by the intuition. But there is also something that is primary to, to our spiritual practices and are the dreams. We have lots of manifestation of the ancestors through the dreams and they are very important to us. For us, uh, dream interpretation is a way of, um, of acknowledging the um, guidance that our ancestors are giving us. They also ask us Questions. They even give us directions, directions like uh, like that can become very real. Like under this tree, you're going to find a pipe. This is what I used to smoke when I was there, and find it, and have it. So 
it is um, a conversation that is wide open through the intuition, through the dreams, and through the journey, intentional looking for your ancestor journey and asking them question guidance for for your growth. This is what I have to offer. Yeah, thank you both. Um, the The only thing I would add very briefly is uh, if it's useful to have a sort of intellectual frame on that question, you're speaking to what is it like to reclaim an animist or relational or indigenous epistemology, uh, uh, animist ways of knowing. And that brings up the question of why don't I already have access to that? which is the question of cultural damage and impact from colonialism. And so the work of reclaiming your innate ability to relate with the spirits and the rest of life is cultural repair work. It's work of uh, getting your connect, like getting the internet connection restored, getting the connection to just the innate relational pathway of exchange with the others back online. And if it takes a minute, be kind about it. It's, a, it's an important undertaking, but it's doable. Um, I want to make space for just one more question, and then we'll, we'll start to weave out, knowing that uh, not everyone, um, you know, we're just not going to have time for all the questions this evening. Yeah, I, th I think it might be Matt, uh, I'm guessing, from the name. And then, uh, yeah, then we'll move to our completion. Thank <coughs> you. So, Santok Sahun Hak, no Huatan Huingwe, Herlongia, and Bubongi Maliet, Solomon Islands. Then, no Gur, no Manaton Cold, no Tua Non, Igangalu Nation. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you. This is my first time to be on your program. My name is Hunak. I'm from the Longia tribe, from the island of Malaita in the Solomon Islands, currently living and working, serving our communities on Gangaloo country in central Queensland, Australia. As a protocol, this is my first time to be here, coming from my ancestry where we are water people in gratitude to all of you, I just want to honor you and thank you to share these words from our spirits, our ancestry, from the waters, to say thank you. Kaho, in the stillness of you, your mysteries hide your depth. In the stillness of you, you behold, yet withhold your breath. In the stillness of you, the winter winds dance on your skin. And in a split second, as ancestors do in playfulness, you cast your radiant smiles in a spin in the stillness of you. The sun's rays peers through the darkest of clouds and reflected, oh yes, oh yes, the shimmering rainbows to the ripples on your skin in the stillness of you as community working with our ancestors. You've dared and shared credulous hope in the dead and thick of winters. For in the stillness of you, only you will ever know your depth, your breath, and your T R U T H, your truth in the stillness of you. Kaho, kaho, kaho. Thank you. 
you for the gift of your voice and your heart from your people and your lands and the waters there. It's, it's really well received. I want to just take a moment in silence together with uh, what you just gifted us with before inviting Okutu to um, weave us out with a song and a prayer. And if you're moved to move your body or to be in stillness or do whatever you want to do with the song and the prayer, that's great. And uh, yeah, let's just be in stillness for a moment together like that, your particular precious stillness. so much everybody for your care and presence we'll, uh, uh, yeah 
Keep rolling with whatever is alive and supportive for you. Keep nurturing that along. And I uh, hope you stay in touch. Appreciate you all. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. <laughs>